So should I close the door or? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, in May of 1906, 18 residents of Sitka, Alaska testified in a federal school integration case, David et al. v. Sitka School Board. So before 1905, all of the Alaska schools were run by the Federal Department of Education, but with separate schools for Native and white children. Then in 1905, the Nelson Act funded locally controlled schools, but only for the white children and children of mixed blood who lead a civilized life. This court case was over Dora and Tilly Davis, the mixed blood stepchildren of Rudolph Walton, were leading a civilized life and could be allowed to attend the school. The judge decided that they were not. Um, the judge defined European and Euro-American culture as civilized and superior, and everything native as savage and inferior. So this case was about defining who was or was not native. But in Sitka 196, it was impossible to find a line between civilized and not civilized or white and native. The only distinction the judge could find was place of residence, but in testimony, even that could not be tied to any marker of civilization. So the school board was the defendants and they argued that native people were uncivilized. Sitka's missionaries supported Walton, the plaintiff, and they agreed that native people were uncivilized, but their position was that they could become civilized. So I wish to acknowledge um, the, the land of the Shtachin Kwan and to acknowledge Rudolph Walton's granddaughter, Joyce Walton Shells' PhD dissertation Rudolph Walton, One Plinket Man's Journey Through Stormy Seas, Sitka, Alaska, 1867-1951. Um, Paige Raybon, um, in her book, Authentic Indians, put this case into a Northwest Coast context. And Sergei Khan's History of the Russian Orthodox Church, Memory Eternal, and the late Robert N. D. Arman's research have been um, essential. So in the fall of 1905, Rudolph Walton's stepdaughters, Dora and Tilly Davis, who are seven and six years old, attended the native school um, operated by the Bureau of Education. The native school closed at the end of 1905 and the girls started attending the new white school. On January 25th, the teacher informed Rudolph Walton that his stepdaughters had to stop coming. So Governor John Green Brady protested the expulsion. One of the members of the school board resigned, but the Juno court refused to take it up. Finally, on March 5th, 1906, Rudolph Walton requested a writ of mandamus from the court in Juneau that would compel the school board to admit his children and four others. Walton was named guardian ad litem for the four other children. Um, finally, both sides agreed to take testimony in Sitka to be sent to the judge. And the witnesses, 18 um, Sitka residents, testified on May 11th and May 12th. Um, Sitka's white residents, who are US citizens, were outnumbered nearly two to one by native residents who were not. Sitka's population of about 1,200 included about 800 residents designated Indian on the census, most of whom lived in the village. Other native families were associated with the mission and resided at the cottages, a Christian native community on mission grounds. The case was never about all of the native children being allowed to attend the school but only such children whose parents were legally married and had adopted the ways of the whites, according to the attorney for the plaintiffs. Only four of the six children named had attended the school, had even attended the school before being told not to come. The teacher testified that the three girls who did were able and well behaved, and those children had been included in the enumeration made to get the school. The school board had received funding for them, so there was no practical reason to exclude these children. So the defendants in the case were school board members W.P. Mills, Sitka's um, uh, leading merchant and businessman, and Janet McCauley Stowell, the wife of the chief clerk of the Sitka Surveyor Office. The school board's position 
was rooted in the ideology of white superiority and inherent and irredeemable native inferiority. Everyone on Rudolph Walton's side, the plaintiffs arguing that the Davis girls should be allowed to attend the school were linked through their association, their involvement with um, the, the Presbyterian Mission School, later known as Sheldon Jackson School. Walton was one of the original students. Um, after his first wife, um, after his first wife Daisy died, he married Mary Davis, the widow of Fred Davis. Around this time, he left the cottages and built a home and store on the edge of Sitka's native village, where he was living when his stepdaughters were refused attendance. Walton's supporters included Governor John Green Brady, who helped start the Presbyterian School, and his wife Elizabeth, uh, Cassia Patton, Elizabeth Brady's sister. Um, had encouraged these families to send their children to the white school after the native school closed. William A. Kelly had been the third member of the Sitka School Board when he resigned over the issue. He was a member of the Alaska Bar. In 1906, he was in charge of the Bureau of Education Schools in Southeast Alaska. So Presbyterian missionaries believed that what held native people back and that would ultimately lead to their demise was their outdated, maladaptive, primitive beliefs, culture, and way of life, that, which left them vulnerable to alcohol, exploitation, and disease. They believed that the only route to success or even survival for Native people was complete replacement of everything Native, from language and dress to appearance and habits with that of the missionaries. This was literally their mission. Um, they supported Native civil rights, but only on condition that Native people first become civilized. And they did not support at all the long-standing goal of native leaders, the recognition of ownership of and compensation for land, salmon streams, and other property. Um, so both sides agreed native people were uncivilized. Um, and this case was over whether some people could become civilized. So in the first strand of argument that Walton was uncivilized, W.P. Mills tried to proved that the appearance of competence was just that, by insulting and demeaning Walton personally. He questioned his knowledge of the law and mocked him for having an expensive cash register when he had no clerk. Um, the defendant's questions of the white fathers of the plaintiffs also seemed to be aimed at establishing inferiority by attacking these men for the kind of work they did, the appearance of their homes. But these attacks against Walton and the fathers had nothing concrete to advance a legal argument. A second strand for the defense was to argue that residents in the village, the native part of town, indicated a person was not civilized. This argument also fell flat. Two of the fathers, George Allard and his son, Waska Allard, seemed to have been regarded with sympathy, and witnesses all agreed that their, chil that their children's residence in the village was simply a matter of financial circumstances. So the location of Walton's home and store in the village as a reason for being uncivilized was also rebutted in a piece in the Alaskan newspaper, which was funded by Brady. So Walton still owned his home at the cottages, but did not live there. Um, the school board agreed that children living at the cottages could attend the white school. A February 10 Alaskan article um, pointed out the absurdity of becoming civilized or not based on where you sleep. Thus, place of residence failed to yield evidence that it made a person uncivilized. A third strand of the defendant's argument was that diet and lifestyle define a person as uncivilized. This was a weak argument and testimony de demonstrated that the families in question were living in a style equal to or above that of many of the white Sitka residents. One girl, Lizzie Allard's grandmother, through an interpreter, affirmed that they had a sewing machine. And Lizzie's father testified that Lizzie and her grandmother had butter. The father of Rudolph Walton's stepchildren, Fred Davis, was dead, but he is still a central figure in the testimony. Witness George Custer Metinoff uh, said he was walking by the Davis home and was invited in to listen to their new gramophone, that they had a carpet on the floor and nice things, and that Fred and Mary Davis had been educated. It seems likely that their homes and education were at least as good and probably better than some in the white section of town. So trying to use place of residence, diet, or carpets to define the difference between white and native was only necessary because ethnicity, or blood, could not be used in Sitka. In 1906, a majority of Sitka's white population had native ancestry. Of the fewer than 400 Sitkans on the 1910 census not listed as native, nearly half are marked on the census as Russian. 
Um, before the United States occupied Alaska in 1867, downtown Sitka was an outpost of the Russian American Company, and most of their employees in, in Sitka were members of the Russian colonial Creole class, descendants of Russian men and Alaska Native women. Nearly all of the Russians who stayed in Alaska after 1867 had Native ancestry. They were granted U.S. citizenship, but Americans looked down on them for their ethnicity and because they had been impoverished. In the American era, they called themselves Russians and worked to distinguish themselves from the Indians or natives who had even lower social status and who were not citizens. Everyone acknowledged that Russians and their children were of mixed blood, but at one point, the defense asked Kelly, representing the plaintiffs, do you consider Russians white people? Kelly replied, I consider Russians white. So most of the 29 children allowed to attend the white primary school were of mixed blood, making the children at the white school as ethnically native as the children of mixed blood the school board wished to exclude. Other Sitka residents were immigrants from Europe or China. So US born European Americans were a small minority. One boy attending the primary school had the note American next to his name on the list of pupils that was an exhibit in the case. It seems he was the only child at the school whose parents were not only white, but had been born in the United States. And even though a requirement was that children be of mixed blood, some children attending the white school who lived at the Russian orphanage were not. Father Andrew Kashavarov said, we have some of mixed blood and some of full-blooded Indians attending the public school. The other difficulty in making ethnic distinctions was that the Russians living in downtown Sitka and the native people or Indians living in the village worshiped together and married one another in the Russian Orthodox Church, which had greatly expanded its Klingit membership <coughs> in the 1880s. This was important because the Presbyterian Church and the Russian Orthodox Church competed for Klingit converts, especially of leaders. Both churches opposed traditional spirituality in the clan system but both churches had to hold back because it would put them at a recruiting disadvantage. The important Kiksedi leader, Kakian, went over to the Presbyterians from the Russian Orthodox Church in 1900, and Sitka's Presbyterian minister at the time had driven some families the other way by being too strict. The problem for the missionaries with their mi was that their mission was to help Native people by having them give up their culture, but their star convert would not. This is the issue in testimony about the potlatch, the traditional Klingit ceremony properly called the Ku'ich. In the late 1870s, certain Klingit leaders sought out a Protestant mission education for their children. Rudolf Walton was one of the, or his, his name was Kawut, was one of the early Presbyterian converts from prominent Klingit lineages. Um, he was a loyal Presbyterian and took pride in his association with the school. The mission featured Walton and his family in its publications for propaganda. Motivated and well-prepared students, such as Walton, were responsible for that mission for that mission's early success. But then in the 1800s, hundreds, uh, 1880s, hundreds of Sitka Klingit people joined the Russian Orthodox Church. And by 1886, they outnumbered Klingit Presbyterians two or three to one. The fierce competition between the two churches may have opened up space for Walton to take part in his clan duties while still being a loyal Presbyterian. In 1903, he was nearly kicked out of the church after he took part in an important Klingit peace ceremony. When he married his second wife, the former Mrs. Davis, in 1905, it was according to tradition, and the Presbyterians did not approve. He was stripped of his position as elder, but allowed to stay in the church. Not only Rudolf Walton or Kowut, but also the deceased father of his stepdaughters, Fred Davis, and witness Augustus Bean, or Kaak Lian Ish, were all important clan leaders in Sitka, and yet all were educated in the mission or government schools and members of the Presbyterian Church. So American and British authorities throughout the Northwest Coast tried to eradicate the, the Kuik. In 1899, Kelly, one of the people trying to get the kids into the school, asked Brady, could you not have a law enacted against rites, ancient rites and ceremonies as tend to keep the native people in a state of semi-barbarism? Brady's annual report for 1902 included a petition asking for a law enacted against potlatches. This was signed by 146 individuals, including Rudolph and Daisy Walton and Fred and Mary Davis, 
Nine or so of the signers were missionaries, but all of the others were native people. So it's remarkable that jo Governor John Brady sanctioned a traditional Klingit ceremonial, the so-called last potlatch, or Kuich, in 1904. It turned out to be a reminder of the clout Klingit clans retained even after decades of repression. The defense, of course, in the testimony, tried to use participation in potlatches as evidence of lack of civilization. What's interesting is that the missionary side argued that it was not uncivilized by arguing it was not meaningful and that it was equivalent of the costume balls put on by the Russian community. Photographer E.W. Merrill was called as a witness because of his photograph of Fred Davis taking part in an 1899 potlatch that was an exhibit for the defense. And he's marked with a pen. Uh, yeah, you can't see it on that, on that image, I guess. He's kind of off to the right there. Um, Merrill insisted he knew nothing of the masquerades and, and refused to concede that Walton could be um, a civilized person. Um, Cassia Patton um, stated that she did not have any objection to the potlatch other than that it was a waste of property and did not consider the native people painting up as barbarous because I have seen white people painted up worse than they. Witnesses testified that Fred Davis took part in the potlatches of 1899 and 1904. Walton did not publicly participate, but did create two carvings commissioned by one of the hosts, Anna Hoots or James Jackson, who's on the left. Um, Walton said that these poles were for ornament and that yes, he had a totem pole of his own for sale in his store, but it was likely everyone in Sitka knew it was much more than that. Um, and wit witness Ka'achan Ish or Augustus Bean um, said that he was allowed to remain a member of the Presbyterian Church in spite of taking part in the 1904 potlatch, but that the church, quote, did not like it. Um, probably because participation in traditional ceremony was a sensitive topic for both churches, potlatches do not appear in the court documents except in the witness testimony. In Sitka, the dispute was also personal between Mills and Brady over Presbyterian um, political influence in Washington, D.C., which peaked in the 1880s. Um, but by 1906, that was on the wane, and um, uh, Governor Brady had served, had been appointed three times as governor, um, probably you know, thanks to Sheldon Jackson's influence. But just before this testimony was taken, he had to resign because of a scandal that he was accidentally involved in. So the, that power struggle between Mills and Brady emerges in Sitka's two newspapers, Brady's um, was the Alaskan, and Mills started a anti-Brady newspaper, the Sitka Cablegram, in early 1905. Um, but Sitka's voters, in 1906, decisively sided with Mills against the Brady and the missionaries. A school board election was held on April 30th, just a few weeks before the testimony was taken. An article titled School Board Vindicated, Cablegram announced and the cablegram announced the turnout of 140 voters was more than double that of the year before. W.P. Mills was reelected with 136 of those votes, which works out to 97%. One vote was cast for Cassia Patton and one for Edward de Graw. So in the end, the school board prevailed. Walton's children were denied education in the white school. Um, Judge Gunnison avoided defining civilization, the lack of which was the proxy for native. The only criterion he and the defendants came up with was living among and consorting with other native people. This is a circular argument. They were not civilized because they consorted with native people who were not civilized because they consorted with native people. But even if the missionaries had prevailed, the vast majority of native children would still have attended a separate school. Um, um, the missionaries believe it would have affirmed the missionaries' belief that native culture, language, and society needed remediation. So the losers were a Sitka's native residents. The case perpetuated racial segregation and doubled down on the no notion of native weakness. Um, the following year, Sitka's native school reopened. Sitka's elementary schools were not integrated until 1942, and the high school um, not until 1949. Dora and Tilly Walton went to the Sheldon Jackson School and were members of the first high school class of 1921. And Tilly died in 1922. 
From the time of U.S. occupation of Alaska in 1867, American leaders systematically excluded Native people from citizenship and from economic, political, or social opportunity, basing, basing this on an ideology of Native inferiority and weakness. And then the effects of decades of discriminatory treatment were used to rationalize and perpetuate the stereotype. In the Davis case, both those advocating integration and those who were against it based their arguments on the assumption of Native cultural inferiority. Most Americans now recognize that racial bias is wrong, but the underlying notion behind the bias that Native culture is simpler and more vulnerable than European culture persists, thanks not only to those fighting Native people, but to those whose mission was to help them. Thanks. <laughs> so I don't know if there's any questions. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the, that, that idea that there's something, you know, like delicate or special, fragile, um, old fashioned, you know, about native culture, I think that still plays into decisions. Cause I, yeah, um, cause I, um, this was like a few years ago, it was like a school board election in Juneau. And I just heard about this secondhand where um, they were asked about having, you know, a Tlingit language immersion in the schools. And, um, and this person running for school board said, oh, well, they don't have any words for science. <laughs> but that, it's that kind of thing, you know, like just thinking yeah. of it as this kind of like extra special little different thing, you know, rather than as, you know, absolutely as, um, you know, uh, useful and, <laughs> and, and strong as, as any other, you know, culture that lasts for thousands of years. So it was it was um, very much very assimilationist, yeah. 
like they discouraged kids from, um, well, like Gil, Dr. Gil Truitt, you know, went there and um, like they, they didn't want them camping, you know, or going out with their families and, yeah. continuity you know the missionaries did never like go away <laughs> Where, you know everybody's yeah all this stuff's still here and, and so it's that um, certain the reasoning that people had to be was all about separating Native people from their land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, yeah, a lot of light bulbs. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Oh, I would like to, to read that report. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. With the BIA report. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, like boarding school report. It's online. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. 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 Right. Oh, no. but I, you know, and can I just say, I mean, 
for me, it's just it's been such an amazing journey for my own, you know, personal healing because Peter Simpson, who was one of the founders of the Alaska Native Brotherhood, who wrote an article saying, you know, that it was entitled Savage and how we needed to quit speaking our language and quit practicing our culture and, um, you know, and then I was able to find a, a, a citizenship paper from uh, a copy online of another one of my relatives from 1916, I think it was 1915 or somewhere around there that the state of Alaska made it possible for us to become citizens, right? Because we weren't, we weren't even though, right, it's our land, our homelands, uh, we weren't considered citizens until 1924, and then not even fully. But then to see that and then read about what he had to do in order to be considered a citizen to try to get the right to vote was he had to have, I think it was a seven people to say, five, five people five. to swear that he was not speaking the language, he was not practicing the culture, and um, they had to go to court with him. And then they had to get all of the teachers in the school to say that he was civilized, that he was not practicing the culture, and he was not speaking the language. And just looking at that, and you know, knowing how deeply we're, we depended on our culture for you know, how we are in the community, and for him to have to get up and swear yeah. you know, in a court of law against these judges and everybody that he was no longer established in order to get that right. And so, you know, I, I, so much of this, I think of what it must have taken for Rudolph, for, for yeah. Rudolph Walton to do that, you know, because it's yeah. right at that time when, you know, there weren't even, you know, probably just after the government decided even it was worth spending a little bit of money to educate us right. in the Western way. Yeah. And to, I mean, the fortitude and the strength that that must have taken for him to do that. And so it's just, I, I, I really encourage people to, yeah, it was a pretty tough time, but you know what, we're still here, and we're yeah. pretty happy, so yes. you know, it's pretty amazing that, you know, so many people have persisted in that strength of culture and identity. Yeah. Yeah. What was the benefit of citizenship for you? Why did you go through it all? Well, you know, I mean, again, I, you choose as what was the benefit of citizenship, it's like, you know, because we had just pretty much lost everything, right? Oh, right, or bored, but like, I mean, they would just come in. It's like, like I said, they had just burned down our economy, and we had, you know, if you don't have power to vote, right, you don't have a voice, and it's almost like, if, again, if you take a look at federal Indian policy or any policy, you know, None of it was really for our own good. It was to have access to the land and the resources. And so when I look at what my great grandfather and a lot of these people are doing is they were trying to figure out how to have a voice in a place that was pretty much telling us that, yeah, we were nothing more than savages. And these were people standing up and saying, no, we're not. Yeah. So, and it was like to be accepted. Yeah. I know in Canada, in our capital, Ottawa, when I was very young, they had signs up, no dogs or Indians allowed, you know, in a, a store. And that's why you wanted to be a citizen, is to be accepted as a human being. It was so degrading. And the advantage for us now is they want to be us because we are saving the land. They realize now what value our land has, the water, animals. So now they're going to want us to teach them. Wow. Yay. That this was is great. great. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is even better than the last. <laughs>